Good morning and welcome to Cedardale. We're so pleased you've joined us. We're just a little country church in Pepperlaw, Ontario, up by the shores of Lake Simcoe. And our doors are open every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for a worship service and everyone is invited to join us. So if you're ever in the area, do drop by and pay us a visit. Today we have a special guest, Reverend Dr. Ian Fitzpatrick, who was our district superintendent for many years and is, was recently our national director for Canada Church of the Nazarene, but now has just very recently retired and graced us with a visit and brought us a very special message from the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to read that passage for you. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And as the scripture says, we hope these words will indeed encourage your heart. And now, here's Pastor Ian with today's message. But I welcome you to the pulpit. Amen. Let it go, Amen. brother. Just let it go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mind if I use this instead of the headset? Is this okay? Yeah. Right. Let's tell you what. You. you know, if I'm putting a picture on the wall, I put it right in the middle. And so I'm going to keep this here, making sure. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Well, listen, I think you might be in for a bit of a disappointment, Grant, you know. So <laughs> I, I hope not, but this is the first time I've preached since I retired. I retired, uh, let's see, a month ago, uh, 30th of April. <laughs> yeah, 30th of April was uh, as national director, so I was district superintendent on this district. In fact, I was district superintendent whenever you were called to this church, yes. so you can blame me. I <laughs> know, uh, you're a dear brother, and he's the spit image of my uh, biological brother back in Northern Ireland. So I uh, retired, I was district superintendent, then I became national director, and uh, you have to retire as national director in your 70th year. And so that's uh, unfortunately what has happened. Uh, so at this annual meeting, which was just held in April, I, uh, I had to hang up the, the boots, uh, so to speak, as national director. So now I'm in a new phase. I've been working in the garden every day, and this is the first uh, time to preach as a retired person. It just seems to me that the theme is very clear this morning. That is the theme about Jesus. We have been hearing everything about him, and I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the difference maker. He is also the one who will bring tremendous offense. We live in a land that, um, you know, will, will tell us that we have religious freedom, and this is not a political speech. Um, we may have religious freedom, but when it comes to mentioning the name of Jesus, there's very little freedom when it comes to that. We can talk about God all day, every day, but when it comes to Jesus, then that's where we will be told to draw the line. But we're not the first culture in the history of the world to be told to do that. In fact, Jesus knew it would happen when he said to his disciples, 
you will be persecuted for my namesake. The disciples, every one of them who followed Jesus, died prematurely. They died because they followed him. So I want you to hear the word this morning. And I know that you've been standing quite a bit, but you've been sitting for a little while. Would you stand as we respect the word of the Lord? Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm just going to read three verses. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. It scorned its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you consider him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of the Lord. You may have seen her. Let's assume that it is the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter to the Hebrews. Now remember who the Hebrews are. The Hebrews were those Jews who were introduced to the gospel of Jesus. So they became converts. They were transformed. They were changed. They were living in the land we call Israel or Palestine. They were there. They were interested in the message of Jesus. And if it's Paul that wrote this letter, and I say if because we don't know definitively, then he writes a letter to the Hebrews. He refers to history in his letter to the Hebrews. The Hebrews would have been people who would have been influenced by two major groups of people. They would have been influenced by the Pharisees, and Paul, whose name was Saul, was one of those before he met Jesus. The Pharisees believed in the written law. They, they, they were people who also believed in oral tradition. They believed in being able to pass along the historical facts of their great history. The Sadducees were people who believed in the oral tradition that you would pass that along, you would sit down with your children, you would sit down with your family, and you would tell the stories of the past. But they did not believe in the resurrection. Not just in the resurrection of Jesus. They just did not believe in the resurrection. And these two groups of leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, had tremendous influence over every Jewish person, including those who now would receive an encouraging letter from the author to the Hebrews. And in a stroke of genius, the opening line of chapter 12 addresses that major theological issue. He goes, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. So without making a big deal out of it, without having a theological conference to determine our belief in the resurrection, he just says it. Therefore, it's a fact. So those of you who were influenced by the Pharisees and those of you who were influenced by the Sadducees, it's just a fact that we are now surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses those who have died, and those who have gone on, and those who are very present in our midst. 
Now, the closer I get, you know, when you're in your 70th year, you think to yourself, okay, I better get that plot ordered, or better get the box uh, ordered, or we better think about where we're going to have our rest so that Grant can get all excited to come and visit me. I mean, the only time he would talk to me without me talking back. But, but you do begin to think of, about that. And, and I, I am a firm believer in respecting those who have gone on before us. And I believe in the church of Jesus Christ, there is a component of those who have gone on before us that we must never forget. I've traveled all over this country in my ministry roles and in many places in the world, and I can tell you that Every time I go into a sanctuary, and a beautiful sanctuary like this, I am reminded that it was built and paid for, in many cases, by people who are no longer here. People who sacrificed, people who eked out a little bit of savings here and there. In some cases, people who remortgaged their homes in order to build the houses of worship that we have the privilege of sitting in today, and I, I would make that almost my uh, soapbox anywhere I go, that we must never forget that. Because the writer to the Hebrews made it such an important point that he opened the 12th chapter with those words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, I want you to do something this morning. I'm not going to ask you to get up and dance. I'm going to ask you to take a look around the sanctuary as discreetly as you can. And I want you to think about people who used to sit in certain places and they're not there anymore. Can't you just see them? Can't you just remember them clearly? Can't you just remember the Mr. or Mrs. who sat in that third row there? They were here every Sunday. They were just an encouragement. Sometimes there were those who were just a pain in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> but you tell me a family who doesn't have a person who's a pain in the neck, and I'll just show you a wax museum. <laughs> <laughs> We're a family with all of our habits and idiosyncrasies and all of our little quirks and all of our weirdness and all of our perfectness and all of our mistakes and all of our sin and everything. And I tell you, that's just who we are. And you can remember those people. And I want you in your heart right now just to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for those people. I want you to think about your family members. Those who used to sit in a certain place in your living room. Those that you would go visit and they would never, ever move. They would always be very predictably boring. Yeah. But they were part of who we are. They were part of our legacy. They're who we are because they're like the moms and dads whose blood runs through our veins are part of the great cloud of witnesses that the writer to the Hebrews is talking about. Listen, we are in the business of eternity. We are not in the business of the temporal. We do what we do in the temporal so that eternity makes sense. So that eternity will be filled with the people who love Jesus and who will stand for what is right and who will not be tossed hither and yon by every wind of doctrine because part of the doctrine is the doctrine of the resurrection that we believe in and we recite every time we say the Apostles Creed. I believe in, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And the one who showed us the way to that resurrection is Jesus, the first fruit of those who will follow. You know, on the day that Jesus was crucified, there were so many people who came out of the grave. Now, if you read the Good Friday account, you can read that. Don't overlook it. 
Because even in the moment of his crucifixion, he was giving us evidence that the reason for the crucifixion is that Sunday is coming. Amen. The reason for the crucifixion is to nail our sins to the cross, but not only that, but to be able to complete a gospel story that is completed when we get to the other side. It is consummated when we get to the other side. Can you imagine? On Good Friday when Jesus said it is finished and he died, the earth quaked, the thunder rolled, and the graves opened. Not only did they open, but they went and showed themselves to their families. So picture Good Friday afternoon, the very first one. And, and you know there's a big event happening in Jerusalem, but you're sitting in the house and, oh, there's a big storm has just come through. You're not sure what's happened and all of a sudden the door knocks. And you open it. And there's Aunt Aggie that you buried 40 years ago. <laughs> now, either you believe that or you don't. Like, there's no in between. Let's face it, there's no in between. There's no gray area when it comes to somebody being resurrected from the dead. It's either, man, I didn't know you had a twin, or it's you. And that's going to happen. And the writer says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, before I go on to the parts of instruction, and I'll be brief, it seems to me that Hebrews here, the writer to the Hebrews, is elevating Jesus to his proper place. But he's also saying, on the strength of the great cloud of witnesses, behave yourself. Now, I'm not saying, you know, there's an old folklore idea that we behave ourselves because, my mother used to say, you better watch where you're going tonight because your granny's looking down on you. And I used to think, no, no, but I could see where she was coming from. It was an old Irishism. You know, you better watch yourself because your granny's a little bit like if you fall off that wall and break your leg, don't come running to me. <laughs> and you go, I, I couldn't do that anyway. If I broke my leg, I couldn't come running to you. <laughs> so these Irishisms, you know, but there's a great amount of truth to it. I think the writer to the Hebrews is saying, listen, if you say that you are who we all think you are, that is, the Jews, the chosen people of God, then since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, not only are, are you accountable to Jesus, not only is our accountability to the divine, but we have a responsibility to those who've gone on before us, and because of that, we are to throw off everything that hinders. Throw off everything that hinders They've already made it. They're leaning over the balcony of heaven and they're saying, now come on, keep going. We've been where you are. We've gone through those things. Now just keep going. Don't be hindered. Don't be prevented from making it to the place we already are. Now I'm not preaching some kind of a weird gospel here because I don't know all the details about the afterlife. All I know is what the scripture here is saying. That if we're going to make it where millions of people have already gone, then we have to throw off everything that entangles. I know more people in heaven than I do on earth now. That just happens the older you get. You know more people who have departed than who are present. The intimacy with which we lived our lives for 70 years should not be lost because now they've gone somewhere else. We should be encouraged 
that through the blood of Jesus that we've just celebrated. Actually, the celebration of the Lord's Supper is a strange connection of words. We celebrate somebody's suffering. We celebrate somebody's death. We celebrate somebody else's agony. The reason why is because we are celebrating the results of that. And so we throw off everything that, that entangles us. You know, Jesus said, be yoked to me. You know what a yoke is? It's that wooden frame that is put over the head of two oxen in the field. They're side by side. And they put this wooden frame over both so that they stick together, so that they both go in the same direction. So that one can't go there and the other go there. They are tied. They are locked in together. Jesus said, I want to be yoked with you. And there is a piece of wood that's put over his neck and mine. And it's the cross. Just imagine the cross, the beam, and this, the two sides. Get a picture of that. And my head's here, and his is here. And anywhere he goes, I must follow. I can't, I can't go anywhere else. I will go where he goes, and where he goes will always be right. It will always be, he'll never lead me astray. And that's what being yoked to Jesus is all about. Where we're not entangled by other things, we are yoked to the truth, and where he goes, I go. What he says, I say. What he commands, I obey. And then he gives us the armor of God to put on. So that we're not entangled. We make sure that we are equipped to fight the battle. But of all of those pieces of armor, you know, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the belt of truth, those are the things which help us to not get entangled. But, and I hope you can leave this illustration very, very quickly. A belt is only as good as when it is fastened. In fact, it becomes counterproductive when it's not. <laughs> there are many Christians who live their life tripping over their own trousers because the belt has not worked. It's not been in the right hole. It's been just loose and the trousers fall down. Now that's why I say, leave that illustration as quickly as possible. <laughs> but that's the picture you get. The belt of truth is not only to be put on, but it's to be tightened up. And the more that happens in our society, the tighter we have to tighten the belt. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, Let's throw off everything that entangles and the sin that so easily destroys us. If the entanglement of disobedience can cause so much trouble, then the perpetual sin of life causes even more. I'm not here to be a judge on who is sinning and who is not. That's God's job, but I do know that the only way to avoid it is to do this. Oswald Chambers, who I love to read, uh, I, watch my time. I love to read, he says on February the 8th, every year he says this because his devotional book on February the 8th says it, that the definition of holiness, and we Nazarenes are good at definitions of holiness. <laughs> Sometimes they're confusing. Sometimes we put too much into it. But Chambers says it is an intense narrowing of all of our interests on earth and an immense broadening of all of our interests in God. Amen. Amen. Now, that's a definition of holiness if ever I've heard one. 
It is an intense narrowing of all those worldly things that try to invade and a broadening of our interests in God. And when our interests in God are broadened, then sin will be the last thing you'll think of. It will. It won't be the first. It will be the last. And when you think of it, God will deal with it. The writer says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that entangles, and let us run with perseverance the path that is marked out for us. I always know when winter's coming. When winter's coming, particularly in a rural area, that's whenever the orange markers go up at the driveways of houses. <laughs> they go in, and you think to yourself, I remember when we first came to Canada, I used to think, what is this? Are fireworks again? You know? <laughs> there were markers, but the snow hadn't come yet. So I didn't know what the markers were all about. I just thought it was a fancy way to welcome you to somebody's house. But the markers were there for when the snow would come. No point putting the markers in after the snow comes. You're already in the ditch. And so this path that we have been walking on is a path that is already marked out for us. Every time you come to church on a Sunday, the path is marked out for us through the preaching of the word and the singing of the hymns. Every day when we read God's word, the path is marked out for us. All we have to do is follow. Follow. And we follow in the power of God's Holy Spirit. And we follow hand in hand with the Lord Jesus, who doesn't do it all for us, but he does it all with us. If he did it all for us, what would life be? There would be no challenges. There would be no chance to disobey. You don't disobey, you don't get forgiven. You don't get forgiven, you don't get redeemed. If you don't get redeemed, you're not saved. If you're not saved, you don't go to heaven. And so there is this opportunity to walk with him as he leads us in the paths of righteousness. Gandhi once said, it's attributed to him, but it was an old Rwandan saying, to people who were pouring money into the country to help rebuild it. Even though it was good, there were problems with it. And the leaders of the Rwandan government came up with a saying, and it goes like this. Whatever you do for me, without me, is actually against me. Whatever you do for me, without me, is actually against me. In other words, if people just throw money at us and say, there you go, there you go, there you go. You know, we're doing it for you. It's actually against the person. It's counterproductive because it doesn't teach principles of responsibility and it doesn't preach a, worth, a work ethic. If that country was experiencing it, then we should too. So the Lord says to us, when we're walking hand in hand with him in the path that is marked out for us, I'm going to walk with you. It's not me alone, and it's not you alone. It's us together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us follow these instructions. Everything that hinders, get rid of it. The sin that so easily entangles, get rid of us. Run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And fix your eyes on Jesus, who started it all and will finish it all. Who's the author and the perfecter. Mark Twain once said, You can't depend on your eyes if your imagination is out of focus. <laughs> You know, I've often wondered, how do we see? Do we see through these, these beautiful blue eyes, or beautiful brown ones, or the green ones, or the multicolored ones, depending on what you're wearing? Somebody laugh. But you know, we don't see with our eyes. 
we actually see with our brains. When the light hits our eyes, it hits the cornea, it goes back and it hits the optic nerve and the optic nerve runs to a part of the brain that interprets what we see. So while we say, oh, I, you know, I can't see, there's something going on in our brain that affects what we are able to see and what we're not. Now you think about the metaphor and stretch it over into the spiritual. When Paul says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, he says it because what we think is what we are. And what we are is what we see. Two people can walk into a room where, and see different things. You can see an argument going on and you think, oh man, I wouldn't go near that. Or you can see a possibility for peacemaking. It's what we have in our heads that allows us to see. And it, it actually is the difference between believing and seeing, and seeing and believing, and believing even if you don't see. Which was the qualifying statement of Jesus to all of his disciples. Paul to the Hebrews affected by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, says, keep your eyes on Jesus. Because Jesus will lead you home. Why is Jesus so important? Because he's the one who will present us blameless before his Father, which is in heaven. Please don't lose sight of that. He is the coming king. He's the wonderful savior, but he is also the Jesus of revelation. He's also coming back one day to gather us to our eternal reward. And I have a feeling some of us might be afraid of that. Have you ever wrestled with your own mortality? Really wrestled with it? Really, really grappled with that fact that, hey, what do you mean? Life's going to go on and I'm not going to be here? How could that possibly be? As a kid, I remember looking out my bedroom window in Lurgan, Northern Ireland, at a lamppost that was right outside my window, and I thought to myself, you're going to be here long after I'm gone. And I don't like that. <laughs> With this I will close. But I hope it's helpful. If Paul is the author of this letter, he is telling those who were, wow, really interested in godly spiritual things. Listen, there's a great cloud of witnesses that is bearing testimony to the faithfulness of God through Jesus. That has to continue. This side and that side. Our children need to know that there is a hope eternal. Our teenagers need to know that there's much more beyond this life. With all of its wars and rumors of wars, economic depressions, threats of nuclear holocaust, all that's going on in our world, I tell you what, I feel sorry for our teenagers and our kids today. They have it rough. You might want to kick their backside sometimes, but they have it rough. We need to present and pave the way. Went to a funeral not so long ago, actually it was January, it was a cold day. Neighbor, friend, his dad had died and went to the service, and the priest, lo and behold, the priest, Father Dominic, he was giving the eulogy. I was sitting back there in a big old cathedral type church in Toronto, and there the, the father and the husband and the grandfather was in the casket at the front of the church. Father Dominic, he just looked out and he said, now listen, there's a lot of you here today, and you haven't been here since the last funeral. He says, maybe I saw a couple of you at the Christmas service, but really, like, just looking out there, and you haven't been here. 
And he said, you're scared stiff coming here on a regular basis. And he went on to tell a story. It was a little bit funny to start with, but wow, he got our attention really quick. He said one day, a lady who was heavily pregnant went into the doctor for one of her final examinations before birth. And the doctor said to the mother-to-be, he said, uh, he said, do you mind if I uh, have a chat with the baby? <laughs> the mother looked at him, wondered what was going on, and he said, well, yeah, just, just let, me, let me have a chat with the baby. So he knocked on the mother's tummy and he said, hello? Yes? He said, how are you doing in there? Oh, I'm not too bad, he says. Great in here. Lovely and warm. And I'm getting all my meals on demand. He said, it's just lovely in here. I, I, I'm loving it. Well, said the doctor, you're not going to be in there much longer. Oh, why? Well, you're going to be born. Born? What's born? <laughs> what do you mean born? He said, well, he said, in a few days, you know, you'll be, you'll be born. You'll leave there and you'll come out into the big world. What? What? Is, what the big world? <laughs> well, the big world's got a sun and a moon and trees and birds and flowers and animals and people. And, uh, no, no, I don't want to. I, I want to stay here. The doctor said, well, that... That's just not possible. You can't stay there. You've got to come out. You will be born. A few days later, the baby's born. And when the baby's able to open its eyes and understand it, it looks up into the eyes of its mom and suddenly realizes that, oh, wow, what was I worried about? As good as it was in there, this, there's nothing like this. Look at you, Mom. Look at you. He said, you know, that is a story of life. Because this is the womb now. And we all get pretty comfortable in it, don't we? It's cozy. We've got our own parameters. We've got our own boundaries and to be quite honest he said some of you just don't want to leave here like this is the be all and end all of things and and you don't want to leave here but the very fact that we're here today and we are ushering this dear man into the presence of God some of you are going no no no, no. and then he leaned into the light and he said but you have no choice you can't stay here forever Get ready to look into the eyes of your Father God and Jesus, who you've been singing about, talking about, reading about, enjoying, but when you get to look into his eyes, there's going to be nothing like it. Amen. So the writer to the Hebrews is saying, therefore, since we're surrounded by those who've already gone that way, get yourself ready because you're going to. Is not that the gospel? Pastor, is that not the gospel message? Is that not why we have to look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher? Because there's a lot of people who are afraid. There's a lot of Christians, actually, too, who are afraid to go on to the next part of the journey. I don't know if I'm just weird, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm looking forward to see Jesus. I love it here. I still want to be here for a while. I love it here, but I'm telling you what, I'm getting ready. Because whether I go to him or he comes to us, which could happen very well, could happen. Scripture is being fulfilled. Prophecies are being completed as we speak. We could be part of the generations that will see Jesus coming back to this earth. How do you feel about it? Amen. How do you feel about that? Nazarenes, how do we feel about that? Evangelicals, how do we feel about that? You know, would we rather get around a piano and sing gator songs till we're 
tired or, or like are we getting ready to see Jesus? And that's not a knock on gate or something. It's, it's not. But sometimes we get comfortable doing traditional folklorist things in the church that can be a distraction from the real meat and potatoes that we need to prepare to see Jesus. Get ready. This is just an appetizer. This is an hors d'oeuvre or a horse's doovers, whatever you call it. This is just the appetizer to get ready for the meal that will never cause us to, to want again. I'll give you something to drink that will last forever, says the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if you're here today and you're scared for whatever reason, put it aside. Get on your knees, figuratively or really. And just ask the Lord to give you the confidence to take you by the hand, forgive your sins, get rid of the entanglement, fix your eyes on him, and he'll lead you home. May the Lord be praised.